The Science Success Center, with funding from Title V, presents Astronomy Workshop, Chapters 1-5 through five of the book Astro by Seeds. Hello, I'm Julia. Chapter 1 discusses the scale of the cosmos, which means how big or small everything is in comparison to everything else. Planet Earth is part of the solar system. The solar system consists of planets and other bodies that are in orbit around our sun. The solar system is also on the Orion arm of the Milky Way galaxy. What if we were lost in space and had to give our complete address to an alien civilization? It's a far-fetched scenario, but first, of course, there's the Earth. Next, remember how the solar system is followed by the Orion arm of the Milky Way galaxy? Then, there's a local group of star clusters, the local supercluster of star superclusters, and finally, the universe. Chapter 2 discusses a user's guide to the galaxy, or to the sky. There is an imaginary sphere around the Earth called the celestial sphere, which depends on Earth's north pole and equator. When it comes to how stars appear to us, at the north pole, observers see stars move in a counterclockwise motion around what is called the north celestial equator. At the equator, observers see stars rise in the east and set in the west. At mid-latitude countries, sometimes stars are up, sometimes they are down. There is a variability in the visible motion of these stars. How much money is our moon worth? Our moon Luna has eight phases, which include four quarters. Four quarters adds up to a dollar, right? That may be a cheesy science riddle, but it's important to remember that at different times we see the moon differently. For example, we can see the entire moon during the full moon phase. However, during the first quarter and third quarter, we only see half of the moon. Seasonal changes on Earth are due to the tilt of the Earth. A solstice occurs as the sun is stationary, and an equinox occurs when there is equal day and night. Eclipsed objects are the objects being blocked. In a solar eclipse, the sun is being blocked by the moon. The moon passes between the sun and Earth. The red arrow points to where sunlight shines on the far side of the moon so that the moon casts a shadow on the earth. In a lunar eclipse, the moon is being blocked by the earth. The moon passes through the earth's shadow. The red arrow points to where the sunlight shines on one side of the earth so a shadow is cast on the close side of the moon. What are tidal bulges? According to NOAA, tides and water levels Tides depend on several factors, including where the sun and moon are relative to the earth. For example, when the moon and sun align with the earth, tides are stronger be to, because the attraction of the moon and sun combine. The gravitational pull of the moon has the most impact on tidal bulges. Chapter 3 discusses the history of modern astronomy. Who created a way to measure the brightness of stars, and what is that system called? Hipparchus created the magnitude scale of stars. The apparent brightness is how bright a star looks from the Earth. Don't get confused with the absolute brightness, which is how bright a star would be if it were a distance of 10 parsecs away. He created the apparent magnitude scale by dividing stars into categories according to their brightness. If a star has an apparent visual magnitude of 1, it is brighter than a star with a magnitude of 6. Think, first class stars are brighter than sixth class stars. From the perspective of Earth, the picture shows how the other planet seems like it's moving in a forward to backward loop. This is called retrograde motion. Ptolemy explains retrograde motion through epicycles, in which planets move in loops around a larger circle called the deferent. On the other hand, Copernicus thought that the planets orbited the Sun and that the Moon orbited the Earth. Copernicus explains retrograde motion by planets passing each other. The planets with smaller orbits, or closer to the sun, move faster, so they overlap the outer and larger planets. Eventually, the planets catch up to each other. At first, there was only basic knowledge, mere conjecture, about the planets. Here is a picture of an epicycle and how Ptolemy thought they worked. Notice the large circle around Earth. That is the deferent. The little circle that moves around the deferent is the epicycle. The line shows the planet's apparent motion of a loop as seen from Earth.
Joannes Kepler had three laws of planetary motion. First, planets move in ellipses, not circular orbits. Second, a line joining a planet and the sun sweeps out equal areas during equal intervals of time. So picture B shows that in six months, the same area is covered on both sides of the ellipse. Third, the square of the orbital period of a planet is directly proportional to the cube of the semi-major axis of its orbit. What in the world does that even mean? According to astrotom.com, Kepler's third law implies that the period for a planet to orbit the sun increases rapidly with the radius of its orbit. Thus, we find that Mercury, the innermost planet, takes only 88 days to orbit the sun, but the outermost planet, Pluto, requires 248 years to do the same. Newton's laws include the law of inertia. An object remains at rest or moves in a straight line at a constant speed unless acted on by an outside force. Second, force equals mass times acceleration. The acceleration of an object is directly proportional to force and inversely proportional to mass. For every action, there is an equal and opposite reaction. Galileo made several telescopic observations, which were controversial because they challenged the views of the Catholic Church. His observations included, Earth's moon is uneven and rough, which means it is not perfect. Moons of Jupiter orbit, so they disappear from day to night, which means planets do not orbit around Earth as the center. And the phases of Venus are similar to the moon, which means the moon is not special. Chapter 4, Astronomical Telescopes and Instruments With a reflecting telescope, a mirror forms an image by bending light. When it comes to the relationship of the aperture of a telescope and its light-gathering power, the bigger the aperture, the more light it collects. With a bigger aperture, the resolving power reveals finer detail with less diffraction, or a fuzzy image. Which major problem led Isaac Newton to invent the reflecting telescope? Something called chromatic aberration which produces distortion of colors. With a refracting telescope, a lens bends light to gather and focus an image. It has a primary lens and a primary mirror. There is an eyepiece and an objective lens, as you can see in this picture. Chapter 5 discusses sunlight and sun atoms. Our sun has a core undergoing nuclear fusion, as well as a magnetic field. There are areas of the sun where the magnetism has created sunspots. These sunspots have an 11-year cycle. There are four fundamental forces of nature. This isn't exactly the force you think when you see Yoda from Star Wars. These forces consist of gravity, electromagnetic, nuclear strong, and nuclear weak. Check the pictures for example. What is radiation? Radiation is anything that spreads outward from a source, such as light radiating from a source. Why is light referred to as electromagnetic radiation? It is made of electric and magnetic fields. It is a wave which carries energy through space and transfers energy. Here are examples of objects seen at different wavelengths on the electromagnetic spectrum. When light is broken up into specific wavelengths, it is called stellar spectra. Remember that wavelengths, light and color are all related. So how can you estimate the temperature of a star with your unaided eye? How does this work? Well, if it's bluer, it's hotter. Well, redder, it's cooler. Thank you everyone for watching. Come visit us at the SSC if you have any more questions. Good luck on all your studies and tune in for the next workshop.